So I'd like to talk about some of the tragedy of war that I read mm. in David Hackett Fisher's book, Washington's Crossing, of a letter that Joseph White wrote He said um, about the Battle of Trenton. He said, my blood chilled to see, hor see such horror and distress, blood mingling together, the dying groans and the garments rolled in blood. The sight was too much to bear. Um, would you describe some of the, or that the soldiers frequently witnessed the graphic deaths of their of their own friends, and would you help us understand some of the anxiety that the, the soldiers felt during the um, as they participated in the Constance Army? Warfare in the 18th century was brutal and bloody because it was at close quarters. Uh, in a more modern time period, you know, wars are waged at distances, and so. The warriors in the field often do not see the carnage that they have caused. In the 18th century, you saw the carnage that you caused. Uh, the muskets were of short range, bayonet charges, and bayonets were the principal weapon. Uh, even cannon were close quarters. So in the midst of a battle, you could not avoid to see around you the men falling. And so the gore was, was quite there and quite present. And it could be clearly quite awful. Medical care was minimal. Uh, both sides provided as much medical care as they could according to the standards of the time. But then when the battle was over, men would have to be taken to usually fairly ramshackle uh, temporary hospitals, and there in many instances left to die. Uh, the wounds, you might not die instantly on the battlefield, uh, but if you were seriously wounded, you might likely die in the hospital. Infection, of course, was a great cause of death. They had no way to cure infection, so gangrene, the only cure that they knew for that was to amputate a limb. And no way to stop the bleeding, no way to operate, and certainly no anesthesia. So anything that they did with these men was done with full pain, unless uh, you had some rum perhaps, but that could be rather dangerous. Uh, so it was a brutal and gruesome, since they had no real sense of sanitary conditions that the facility itself was full of blood and gore. The notion of a clean, sterile environment was completely alien. That would be a, a hundred years ahead from this time. And the noise, the, the sounds of the men, the suffering and anguish, truly quite horrible. But the point to remember, I think, about 18th century warfare is that it was so very, very real, so present in such a confined environment. If you were a soldier in battle, you could not escape it, and you saw it afterwards as well. The task of cleaning up the battlefield, as they would say, was truly awesome. And not just the men and the mangled bodies, but think too of all the animals, <laughs> that uh, all of the horses or oxen or whatever animals had been used to bring artillery, wagons, etc., etc. They too fell to battle. So the carnage was really quite extreme. After the battle, there was a general sense of a protocol in which you would allow the enemy to come forward and, and find their wounded, if indeed they could, yeah, and they would find their wounded. So both sides would give a, a moment of respite to allow the cleaning up. But again, the noise, the smells, the blood, the gore, all so very real, so very present that you simply could not avoid it. Wow, that's so tragic. Uh, so bayonets were the primary um, primary weapon? Yes. <clears throat> uh, in battle, in regular battle certainly, when two armies approached one another, the principal, they would lower their muskets, and these are smooth bore muskets. They fire a lead ball, about uh, one ounce or so of lead, uh, and the point was to fire all the muskets, the men in line, to fire together to s send forth a barrage of lead. The range of the weapons was relatively limited, a hundred yards at maximum with any degree of accuracy. And so after the two sides had fired their muskets, they then would approach one another. They might have an opportunity to fire again, but these two armies, these two lines approaching at a fairly good clip, would close rather quickly, and that's when the men would use their bayonets. And most of the damage done on the battlefield was done by bayonets. Uh, and again, this terrible, terrible method of, of warfare. Well drilled, to be sure, these men then approached. It was the power of the impact. If you can imagine two bodies of men, thousands of men, coming together at this one moment and then impacting this huge collision of bodies <clears throat> and, the, and the resulting battle that would then take place and the carnage and the violence. 
So what would motivate somebody to participate in the Continental Army? Was it uh, that they believed in the cause or that they wanted recognition and glory or what would motivate somebody? I think all of those things, certainly men driven by the cause of liberty, that was certainly true of a man like Washington and the leaders of freedom and liberty of the, of the cause of America. And then the men would enlist, perhaps for excitement. A young man, 18 or 19 years old, would see this as a moment of excitement, getting off the farm. That might be attractive. The money, well, less so. The, the money wasn't very good, even when they could get it. So I doubt that money was a big uh, barrier. Also, once you're in uniform or once you're with your fellow soldiers, the notion of being together, comradeship, uh, meant a great deal. So that when you went into battle, the notion of, of not leaving your friends behind, uh, the notion that you too had to stand in line of battle to avoid embarrassment, uh, one of the greatest motivations for men in battle. In fact, uh, the men to your left, the men to your right, and the men behind you, you are with them. They depend on you, you depend upon them. So it is truly a, a body of soldiers, a, a band of brothers. Mm -hmm.